please join me in prayer. Your love, O oh God, so deep, so broad, so high, is beyond all thought and imagination. Help us to not narrow grace too much with too many rules or doctrines. Instead, give us a spirit of kindness to welcome all people with affection, so that your church may never exclude your secret and forgotten friends. Give us grace to not only recognize, but to emulate the wide and extravagant love and grace of Christ, who came to save us all. Amen. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of the two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosened in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. I was so offended when you fill in the blank. When were you so offended that even hours later your mind kept returning you to the scene of the outrage? Maybe you quickly phoned a friend to say, you won't believe what so-and-so just said or did to me. And then you relayed the whole long story, counting on your ally to share your ire. Or maybe you nursed that grievance privately, replaying the scenario in your mind for weeks, months, maybe even years savoring the lingering bitterness toward the person or institution or publication which wronged you so unjustly. We don't need to look far to find public expression of such indignation. Our social media feeds are filled with it. For something as minor as being asked to wait an additional three minutes before a server comes to our table to get our orders, our smartphones will allow us to immediately post a Yelp review. With immunity, anyone, anywhere can condemn and name a business and its employees, publicly shaming a stranger we don't even know for his or her shortcomings in that moment. Twitter. Instagram and Facebook all allow us to name names of the people who cause us offense, whether strangers or lifelong friends, without a nanosecond of reflection before broadcasting our most recent injury. Unfriending has become a common turn in the shared lexicon. Cryptic status updates on social media predictably provoke a plethora of private messages inviting all eager gossips to feed the need to dish the dirt on the latest outrage-inducing incident. So all this technology meant to enhance our communication ability, where has it gotten us? While communication platforms have advanced greatly since the author of Matthew penned his gospel, we, the platform users, remain remarkably like our brothers and sisters of two millennia ago. We're easily offended. And in the throes of hurt feelings, we often make all the wrong moves. And we need someone to guide us into a better way. Matthew puts into the mouth of Jesus a warning that we should be careful how we handle our affairs when offenses are made. For whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Dr. Jeremy Troxler of Duke University tells a story about his mama 
After considerable conversation among the family members, it was unanimously decided it was tell, time to tell Mama that she needed to hand over her car keys and stop driving. Troxler said this was not an easy conversation for anyone to have, especially when you consider that his grandmother is a stubborn woman who once chased a thief through the grocery store parking lot after she saw him trying to steal her number 43 Richard Petty license plate. But after his cousin had a pulse racing, white knuckles clenching the armrest, NASCAR-like ride to town with Mama behind the wheel, it was clear to everyone that the issue of Mama's driving wasn't actually funny anymore. Her number 43 vanity license plate was far too believable. The possibility that someone could be seriously injured by Mama's driving had become a near certainty and someone needed to talk to her directly about it. So Troxler's mother asked, Mama, can we talk? We're concerned about you. And that conversation <laughs> did not go well. Mama's response was to tell her daughter and her granddaughter and all the rest of the family, you all stay out of my business. Troxler says she didn't understand that this wasn't just her business. It was the family's business because we're going to be the ones called to an accident scene someday, she, he says. And it's not just our own business, but the business of every other person behind the wheel on the road. Do not drive near Reedy Fork in Greensboro until this is resolved, Troxler says. My grandmother with keys in her hand is a ticking time bomb. Troxler then aptly adds, so are all the ways we refuse to love and to be loved. It's not just my business. Sometimes someone needs to take us aside and say, I'm concerned about you. Consider letting go of those keys you're gripping so tight. Well, in the 18th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, he gathers together a significant body of Jesus' teachings about sin, confrontations over offenses, both offenses given and offenses perceived, advice about broken relationships and forgiveness, and the power of honest and direct communication. Again and again, the focus of Jesus' teaching is the methodology of reconciliation, not mechanisms for condemnation. The passage we read today about binding and loosing is bracketed on both sides with some of, teachers, some of Jesus' most familiar and beloved teachings illustrating the power of forgiveness. Just before this text, Jesus tells the parable of the shepherd who sets out in search of that one lost sheep rather than staying with the 99 who never wandered away. And then after this reading comes that story where Jesus tells Peter he must forgive his brother who has offended him, not seven times, but seven times 70 times. So this teaching, which lays out a process of seeking reconciliation, is all laid out in the context of a community which lives by the seven by 70 approach to forgiveness and the seeking of the least and the lost so that they can be brought back into the fold. We need to remember that as we read the scary lines about Christians living in a community where they boldly engage in face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball, human-to-human confrontations. Yes, this process asks us to name the sin aloud in person-to-person, -person, candid conversation with the party who has offended. It advises us to always, let's say that word again, always begin the process of dealing with our sense of being offended by privately trying to deal directly with the offender. Well, unfortunately, we too often jump to the very last part of this passage as we lick our wounds, sure that Jesus is on our side and that shunning a person who has caused offense is okay by Jesus. Well, that is absolutely not what this passage says. Again, the first step is always directly communicate the offense privately to the person who has offended us. Work it out between the two of us. The goal is always reconciliation, the restoration of relationship. 
This week during our Lectio Divina prayer time, we were listening prayerfully to this very passage. And I shared with those who gathered in this room a story from very early in my ministry. It was the spring before I left to go to Kentucky and attend seminary. I had asked the director of field work at the seminary to place me in a pulpit ministry rather than an associate position because I'd already had experiences in youth and community service ministries during college. I told him I could move to the seminary the day after I graduated from college if it would help me get a pulpit. And I was told almost all students started their field positions in September and I should count on that. Besides, most of the small country churches offering those preaching positions were reluctant to call a female student. I'm just probably going to have to settle for a Christian education position, he told me. Well, meanwhile, at my home church, the Christian Education Committee was preparing for vacation Bible school, and I was asked if I was willing to be the VBS director. The VBS director of the last several years had given them a hard no, and they needed to get planning underway. Well, I explained that there was a very small chance that I would be leaving for seminary before VBS even happened. And I'd never directed a VBS before. But the previous director was a friend of mine. We went to the same young adult Bible study. So I went to her and asked if she would co-direct with me. She was older, already a parent with kids in the VBS and had so much experience. Well, reluctantly, she agreed. We chose a curriculum and began recruiting. Well, it was only a couple of weeks later that at our Bible study time together, I ecstatically told the whole group I had heard from the field ministry supervisor at the seminary and a church wanted me. I was going to have a pulpit placement after all. I was starting in May. My co-director for VBS became strangely silent and left early without congratulating me. I heard later from a friend that she was furious that she had been trapped into directing VBS when she had told the whole church last year she wouldn't do it again. Our Bible study leader had me read Matthew 18 and told me I needed to call her. I needed to set up a time when she would allow me to come to her home so we could talk this through. Driving my battered old VW over to her house and mustering the courage to ring that doorbell was easily the hardest thing I had ever done at age 21. She was so angry with me. But she did invite me in, and I can still picture her sitting there in her living room across from me as we talked. As our Bible study leader had instructed me to do, I apologized to her directly without making any excuses or justifications. I told her I knew before I asked her that she had made it clear she didn't want to do the job. I understood why my leaving her in the lurch was so upsetting. And then I was quiet and I just listened. I heard how much stress she was under with a medically fragile child and now a new baby on top of that. I heard how events in Egypt were affecting her parents-in-law in Cairo, and how the work stresses that her husband was under were impacting her and the kids. And it was clear to me she had faithfully discerned a year ago that she should say no to this job, just as she had done. And it had been completely unfair of those of us who wanted her help to be putting pressure on her in the ways that we had. I felt personally indicted, but I also experienced tremendous grace from her as we acknowledged the truth of what had happened between us. As we continued in our conversation, we explored ways that I could help before I left in getting the VBS groundwork done. We brainstormed together other people who could take over and lead this as a team. Our friend from Bible study who sent me over there picked up the ball the most and saw that VBS through. And in the end, I did leave early for seminary and began as a preaching pastor in 1983 with her blessing. 
But every time Matthew 18 cycles back around in the lectionary, I remember that difficult conversation, which taught me the value of honesty when offense has been given or received. And I still marvel at the wisdom of my friend who sent me into what felt like a fiery furnace. He functioned as that third-party mediator that Matthew mentions, ready to step in as arbitrator if needed to heal the breach. Now, in this little example, there was no whole church prayer meeting to discuss the sin and the sinner, that would be me, but I did feel the prayerful support of the wider congregation. Airing this conflict helped many of us to think about how we sometimes pressure people to say things that they don't really mean, to say yes when they've already said no very clearly. The focus of the whole 18th chapter of Matthew is on reconciliation, restoration, healing the brokenness in our relationships. This is a teaching about the power of direct and hard conversations at the very beginning of any experience that any of us have of feeling offended by any other of us. The goal is to interrupt that painfully familiar cycle of revisiting hurt feelings and nursing grievances that begins when we choose not to directly approach an offender one-on-one, -on -one, privately, with the goal of reaching understanding and healing a breach. Loving truthfulness is the key to the whole passage, talking to people not about people. Loving truthfulness is Jesus' way, and this is a practice that is made possible in communities which promise to forgive each other rather than to condemn. The model that Jesus holds up is one of mutuality, of people who do not just parrot the words, forgive us our sins as we forgive others who have sinned against us, but who actually believe in that and have the self-awareness that is required even to pray such a prayer. In the faith community that Jesus seeks to build, all acknowledge their own impaired perception, their need for the corrective vision that comes from honest conversation with others. Because too easily wounded pride reenacts that moment when offense was taken, and we see it only through our own lenses. That first meeting is not a guns blazing assault on the one who has angered us. It's a Mama, we need to talk moment. A prayerful desire to do what's best for all in the community, including the one on whom conversation is centered today. Toward the end of Matthew 18, Jesus offers one last promise that casts this teaching in a particularly hopeful light for me. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. I don't know about you, but I've heard that prayer, uh, that promise, quoted so many different times. And it's usually quoted on those Sundays when church attendance is particularly low, or when only two people remember to show up for a board meeting. And we tend to hear those words as assurance that even if just a few of us are present in the church building, well, Jesus is still here in the church building. But here in Matthew 18, Jesus says this in the context of two or three people who have met to struggle together through the issue of sin and conflict, forgiveness and reconciliation. Jesus assures us that whenever we own up to the splinters and logs in our own eyes, whenever we admit that a relationship has experienced some kind of a break, whenever we own up to the possibility that we have done something that offended another, Jesus is here among us, right here with the two or three people trying to sort through a thorny conflict. So whenever we wrestle together with the hurtful, fraught, important things that happen between people, Jesus will be there. Jesus does not run from the difficult conversation. So what if we, as Christian community, 
took this teaching from Jesus out into the world, where we are called to be salt and light and yeast. What if we shared with the world a practice that we have internalized of seeking the repair of every breach in relationship through direct and honest person-to-person -person communication? We invite you now to share with us in the Lord's Supper as our elders for today, Elizabeth Slifer and Judy Ridlin, pray for the bread and the cup. You are invited to partake of whatever it is you have today to eat and drink as we remember the reconciling nature of Christ's ministry and are made one with one another in the whole body of Christ through the gift of this feast of love. Will you join with us? And we pray for the bread. Lord in the highest, we come to you today with joyful hearts. We may not be together, but we are one in spirit as we prepare for communion. Lord, thank you for today, for the stars at night, those flashes of brightness, especially the meteors showering down. We thank you for the sun and the moon, the wind and the rain, the flowers and the trees. God, you created such a lovely world. Let us give thanks now as we break the bread. Jesus blessed it on the night of the Last Supper, and so we too bless this bread. May we live up to all the hopes and desires that you have for us. Lord, be with each of us this week as we do your loving work. Amen. Oh God, in these days of COVID-19, school starting, senseless violence, racial tension, political derision, and so many world problems, we remember the cup of Christ's blood shed for us. It is the cup of salvation and grace, which binds us one with another. Even though each of us is challenged by our prejudices, criticism, and inconvenience of a pandemic, Help us see one another in love. On this day, may we comfort and may we find comfort and unity in the knowledge of your love for each of us. Bind us together, forgive us, and lead us in the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are sent out with these words from the Apostle Paul to his friends in the town of Ephesus. I pray that, according to the riches of God's glory, God may grant that you be strengthened in your inner being with power through the Holy Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. 